it's Lady Boulay, and I hope you're having a blessed day. Thank you for your support. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. Thank you for your thumbs up, for your comments, and thank you for sharing the videos. Thank you for all you do to support the channel. And yes, we are commanded to love one another, whether we want to or not, or whether we agree with each other or not. This video is for educational purposes only, to foster understanding, to give some educational value to the laws of America and how America has evolved as a nation. But it's for educational purposes only. This is information we all need to know because it is documented. And what do I say about white people? Whatever they do, they'll write it down so you don't have to lie on them. The article I'm going to be sharing is from Time Magazine and it's entitled How Virginia Used Segregation Law to Erase Native Americans. But they're not saying what Native Americans in the headline of that article, but it's talking about black Native Americans, black indigenous populations. They erased them through the law, just like they've been saying all the time. So I want to share this article. How Virginia Used Segregation Law to Erase Native Americans. On March 20th, 1924, the Commonwealth of Virginia enacted the nation's cruelest, most draconian segregation law designed to preserve white racial purity. The legislation became a model for states across the Jim Crow South and beyond. So all of this heartache and misidentifying people was about preserving white racial purity. In the halls of Richmond's Capitol Building, lawmakers congratulated themselves on passing the Act to Preserve Racial Integrity, popularly known as the Racial Integrity Act. The Act made it a felony to falsify the racial identity of an individual on birth, death, or marriage certificates and banned marriages between whites and non-whites. Both offenses carried a sentence of one year in jail. So if you told the truth about who you were and that wasn't the truth they wanted to hear, you got a year in jail. Some white Richmonders, though, weren't satisfied. They worried about a loophole in the law that would dilute the purity of white blood. Leading white supremacists had wanted the Racial Integrity Act to solidify Virginia's black-white racial binary. To do so, they called for the act to erase the presence of Native people. In the coming decades, some used the act to do this, engaging in a form of bureaucratic genocide to recast Native people as black, rendering them less visible in the historical record. The legacies of these policies endure to this day. Virginia's Racial Integrity Act belongs to a settler colonial tradition extending back to the early 1600s. In 1630, Hugh Davis, a white man, received a public whipping for defiling his body by lying with a Negro. Over the ensuing decades, Similar cases prompted Maryland in 1661 and Virginia in 1662 and 1691 to pass stricter laws against interracial marriage and cohabitation. How to define the progeny of interracial sex and marriage continued to vex lawmakers throughout the 18th century. In 1785, Virginia's General Assembly passed a law that held every person who shall have one-fourth part or more Negro blood shall be deemed a mulatto. In 1910, new legislation redefined non-whites 
as people with 1 16th or more Negro blood. Now, nobody knows how they measured it, but it just came up in the legislature. So I guess they would just eyeball it and determine how much Negro blood you had, <laughs> which is absurd. But as white racial anxiety surged in the early 1900s, these older racial definitions failed to satisfy increasingly vocal white racial extremists. They saw threats to white blood everywhere. Small but growing numbers of Asian immigrants sparked fears of a yellow peril while swarthy multitudes from Southern and Eastern Europe caused growing concern among old stock Anglo-Americans. So in the 1900s, other people started coming and they didn't meet the standard of pure white blood. But it was the enemies within who truly terrified the defenders of white racial purity. Some claimed to possess data proving that mixed race or colored populations had grown by over 80% between 1890 and 1910. Was the American population becoming mongrelized? Would white Americans take the threat of race suicide seriously and act to stop the rising tide of color? In Virginia, Anglo-Saxon clubs, white supremacist social organizations formed in the 1920s to lobby for stronger anti-miscegenation laws answered the call. Their ideology combined eugenics or the belief that racial characteristics were inherited from one generation to the next and long-standing racial prejudice against blacks and Native Americans were the answer to the call of whether or not whites were going to take the race suicide fear seriously. The future of white supremacy seemed secure when the Racial Integrity Act became law in 1924. But for people like John Powell, a leading figure in the Anglo-Saxon clubs, a dangerous loophole remained. While the act clearly defined a white person as someone who has no trace whatsoever of any blood other than Caucasian, the Pocahontas Clause allowed for exceptions. The clause was a concession to prominent Virginia families who claimed descent from the 1614 marriage of the Pamukkale teenager Pocahontas and the English planter John Rolfe. Under the clause, these descendants enjoyed a white legal status if they had less than 116 Native American ancestry. For Virginia's Anglo-Saxon clubs, the Pocahontas Clause represented an open invitation for light-skinned African Americans to try to pass as Indians or worse, white. Now how do those African Americans get light-skinned in the first place? That's an open question for anybody that wants to answer it. Walter Plecker agreed. Plecker despised the Pocahontas Clause and lobbied lawmakers for increasingly draconian segregation laws. Between 1912 and 1946, Plecker served as the Commonwealth's Registrar of Vital Statistics. <laughs> In this position, Plecker turned to old census records to rewrite history and prove that people claiming Indian blood were actually Negroes. Under Plecker's reign, Virginia reclassified hundreds of Virginia Indians going back to the 1850s from Indian to Negro. Okay, that's the hook right there. That's the hook. He reclassified hundreds of Virginia Indians going back to the 1850s from Indian to Negro. Okay, that's what they've been saying. For decades, Plecker bluffed, lied, and bullied local officials, midwives, educators, 
and married couples in his crusade to preserve white supremacy. Plecker scrutinized every birth, death, and marriage certificate filed in Virginia. He often insisted that people who claimed Indian blood refile paperwork as Negro because he believed Virginia's real Indians had vanished. If remnants remained, he often wrote they were likely Negroes in feathers. Whoa! Plecker's campaign to erase Virginia Indians took a particular interest in the Chickahominy. Plecker relied on rumors and innuendo to label the Chickahominy as mulattoes and lapooned Edward Bradby, the Chickahominy chief, as a mulatto and a fraud. Plecker also cast doubt on the indigenity of the Pamaki and Mattapani. Both communities lived on reservations east of Richmond. Still, Plecker believed that people claiming Pamaki and Mattapani ancestry were more black than native. When he learned that the Pamaki had banned intermarriage with African Americans in 1887, he mocked the law, insisting it was 200 years too late. Plecker's policing of the Racial Integrity Act created an atmosphere of fear among Virginia Indians. Across the Commonwealth, tight-knit kinship communities lived in fear of Plecker reclassifying them as black. In other instances, indigenous families were divided by local registrars when a family member presented with darker skin, prompting a categorization as Negro. Such people ran the risk of having their indigeneity defined out of existence by bureaucratic racism. Oof, this is too much. Plecker accelerated his campaign of bureaucratic genocide in the 1930s and 40s by continuing to reclassify Native people as Negro in the files of the Registrar of Vital Statistics. In 1930, his work received a boost when a revised Racial Integrity Act made it easier for the Registrar of Vital Statistics to define out of existence Native people who had one drop of black blood. Typical of Plecker's campaign of racial intimidation, he wrote to Mary F. Adkins, a midwife from Roxbury, Virginia, on January 13, 1942. His letter cajoled and intimidated Mrs. Adkins, instructing her to stop issuing birth certificates because she was illiterate. Plecker believed that the birth certificates submitted by Adkins must be forgeries and refused to approve them. At the conclusion of his letter, he got to the real point for his objection, asserting, This Indian stuff has gone far enough, but I am not prepared just at present to say what will be done to make examples of some people. Plecker's letter often concluded with vague yet ominous threats. Convinced of the righteousness of his cause, Plecker never gave up his fight for white racial purity in Virginia. Prior to his retirement in 1946, he expressed continued alarm at the presence of mulattoes or colored people in the Commonwealth. And he had nothing but contempt for a growing body of scholarship that emerged in the 1940s and highlighted the social benefits of multicultural and racial diversity. Such authors, Plecker insisted, were freaks who'd been misled by communistic sources and foreign college professors. Not until 1967, when the United States Supreme Court ruled anti-miscegenation laws unconstitutional in Lovin v. Virginia, did the legal foundations for white supremacy in Virginia crumble. But as black and native Virginians know, the massive resistance of whites to civil rights reforms 
and diversity initiatives between the 1950s and 1970s represented an ongoing reminder of the Racial Integrity Act's enduring legacy. Indeed, since the 1980s, the efforts of Virginia's tribal communities to attain state and federal recognition routinely encountered roadblocks caused by the absence of archival records and documents altered by Plecker and his staff. In the case of the Pamukkale Indian tribe, it took 25 years for the tribe to gain federal recognition through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. For a further six tribes and nations of Virginia, it took congressional legislation before they won federal recognition. A century after the passage of the Racial Integrity Act, Virginia's Indian communities haven't forgotten the dark days of Jim Crow racism. They haven't had that luxury. As Lynette Alston, chief of the Nottoway Indian tribe of Virginia, reminded us recently, the Racial Integrity Act engendered so much fear in tribal communities that it meant indigenous people lived so quietly we had to live secretly. This, Alston adds, was an act of survival, acts that make it possible for Virginia Indians to reclaim their identities and their sovereignty in the 21st century. This article appeared in Time Magazine written by Ashley R. Craig, a community engagement and partnerships specialist at Library of Virginia, and Gregory D. Smithers, who's a professor of history at Virginia Commonwealth University. And this is a series called Made by History. Okay, y'all, thank you for listening. This was a lot to take in. Have a great day.